Thanks very much, Joel. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. First of all, just a, a thanks to Joel for being for being the tech wizard. Um, I am not a tech wizard. It uh, behooves me to thank him for his uh, expertise in that. So, um, as you may know, my name is Pritam. I am uh, I use he him pronouns. Uh, I am on the board at FMO, and I. Uh, I've loved this organization since the first day I came to a conference several years ago now. So thank you for joining us in this sort of new world that we're in. We've got some wonderful uh, panelists today that I will introduce shortly, but uh, I thought it would be, uh, I thought it was important to first recognize that the FMO office, Folk Music Ontario office, sits on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek uh, peoples. Um, you know, wherever we are, we're most likely on, on treaty lands and, and should uh, respect where, we, where we've come from uh, to, to what we've been able to do here. So um, <clears throat> thank you for letting me do that. Uh, so let's go on to, because we want to talk about streaming and, and how to, uh, finding our digital voice uh, or finding our voice on a digital stage. Um, we have with us Danielle Allard, Tim Fraser, Tarun Nair, and Kathleen Ryan. Uh, I've got little brief intros, and then I will let them do some talking as well. So, uh, Danielle Allard, uh, I love that Danielle's uh, website bio says singer songwriter, chameleon. And I also love that I uh, learned that. Uh, that, that there is a fun FAQ, frequently asked questions section in her website, where I learned that she wanted to be a brontosaurus and not a musician. So that is pretty cool. Uh, Tim Fraser, currently the artistic director of Home County Music and Art Festival in London, Ontario, which many of you will know. Um, uh, before that, he spent time at True North Records. He's been uh, at Fanshawe College. He's run his own company. Um, but his first job I learned was at Sunrise Records and Tapes. Uh, and I don't know where that was, if it was in London, Ontario at uh, Masonville or wherever that was. Was it Masonville? Nice. Good guess. <laughs> sure was. <laughs> Uh, Tarun Nair is currently the uh, executive director of Vancouver's 5X Festival, um, which champions South Asian culture for ages 16 to 35. Um, something I, I learned about 5X, which I think people would really love to know, if you go to the 5X uh, website, you'll see that they have a female forward policy, which I thought was a really uh, great thing to have. and, and uh, it was something that I enjoyed reading, so everyone should go check that out. Uh, you may also recognize Thorne from uh, as a member, as a founding member of a uh, festival favorite band called Delhi to Dublin. So thanks very much for being here. Um, and finally, and, uh, we have Kathleen Ryan, who uh, through K Ryan Productions, uh, Kathleen's worked with. Uh, a variety of clients over the years, ranging from Jimmy Kimmel Live to Sick Kids Hospital to Canadian Music Week. Uh, spent some time doing things with the Olympic Games. So I can't imagine there's been a dull moment in her life for the past several years. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for, for joining us. And thank you to uh, FMO for having this panel and to everybody who uh, joined us today. It's fun to be able to look into your worlds, into your homes. <laughs> um, it's a it's a strange thing. It's it's a very strange thing that's that's become of us, and and that we we've now uh, started to uh, do things this way. Um, some of us have started to do this very recently, and I'm curious to know from our panelists. I mean, maybe that's uh, a question that you can answer uh, just off the top. Is uh, if I can call on you to just give us a little bit of background on on who you are, and what you do, and how you how streaming, uh, live streaming plays a role in your uh, in your career, uh, and maybe if it's something that started with the pandemic or it's something that you've been doing uh, for a long time anyway, and that you've just had to hone it a little bit since. So, um, I will start with Danielle if you could answer that for us. 
So many questions. And I, that was one of the greatest introductions that I've ever had, Pritam. Thank you. Uh, pretty much all you need to know about me is that I wish that I was a brontosaurus. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of music, I've been playing most of my life. Uh, I've been playing professionally uh, for about 12 years now. And that number keeps increasing. And I don't understand where the time goes. But I've been doing a lot of local stuff. And I've gone on a couple of tours, but it's a lot of local stuff. So when it comes to live streaming, I am a pandemic newbie. So it was two days after lockdown. I did my first live stream because I was supposed to be playing a live show. It was supposed to be a charity show. And I was feeling so badly that weekend. And it hurt so much to see everybody struggling with everything that was going on that I said, you know what, Sunday night, we're going to go live. We're going to see what happens. We're going to hit that button. And if it's just a distraction for a couple of hours from everything, for everybody who I know and love face to face in real life, then that's huge. And from that moment, these last few months have kind of spiraled out of control for me in a nice way. Uh, but I ended up just testing out all of the different platforms uh, and really finding a home for myself on Twitch. So as of May, I started uh, live streaming on Twitch, became affiliate extremely quickly. Uh, and now it's, it's the workload is kind of getting difficult to keep up with. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. And it's given me this incredible opportunity to connect with people. And it has been a strange transition to know that I, I can see everybody in the room and perform for everybody in the room. And now they're just in a chat box. So that's been something to get used to. But uh, it has definitely given me a lot of experience in a very short period of time. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Uh, Joel, everybody else on the on the FMO team that has invited me today, I'm really excited to be able to share any lessons from the past few months because it is a journey to get started. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, I think one thing that's important to note is that we probably in this panel of people who are attending today, uh, we have some newbies like uh, Danielle said she was and that I certainly am still um, and probably people who've been doing some live streaming or may have done it already. So um, let's just try to keep that in mind so that we know how to uh, proceed here uh, to try to reach the, the most people we can. Uh, Tim, what, uh, how are things in London? Uh, it's hot right now, um, as, as I'm sure it is most places. Um, but uh, London is great. Hi, everybody. Um, most of you, as Freedom did mention, most of you know me in this world um, as uh, somebody I used to manage artists, um, and I'm now the artistic director at Home County. Um, we are doing a virtual festival this year, which was a pretty quick turnaround. Um, much like everybody else in the festival world, um, I'll be able to talk to that um, in a little bit. But uh, some of you might not know, but uh, another thing that I do is I work for a booking agency who's based out of the United States called Deggy. Uh, I am the only Canadian person who works for them. I run all of our operations in Canada. So we are a full service booking agency that primarily deals in the university and college and uh, military market. So we're the biggest talent buyer for the United States military. We run all of their tours through all of their Navy bases and army bases um, all across the world. Um, I primarily work in the college and university space uh, in Canada and the States. Um, so I do a lot of uh, major talent buying. Uh, so I help universities with their speakers and, uh, you know, major shows, uh, did shows with, Bill and I, the science guy this past spring and work with people like Loud Luxury and uh, so kind of everything from small to big. So when the pandemic happened there, when it started in March, we were right about to hit our busy season for college shows, specifically in the States. Those all went away, obviously, as things shut down and we very quickly made the transition to virtual to try and save as many shows as possible. Um, uh, for anybody that follows Deggy on Facebook, and I highly encourage you all to, um, we started doing free shows on Friday night. We called it Friday Night Live, and we were pretty much just giving free entertainment to people on Friday. So we had uh, ever, anybody from uh, All American Rejects uh, to uh, Bowling for Soup. Um, we did a number. We were doing shows every Friday night. Hunter Hayes came in and did them. So we were 
utilizing our partnerships and connections with the major agencies to bring major talent. Uh, and in doing so, we've developed our own kind of virtual platform for developing shows and presenting shows. So we have a partnership with a production company uh, out of the U.S. called FanFX, uh, where we're delivering fully virtual shows for our clients. Um, and it's basically, it's, it's just a higher quality version of a Zoom room, but we've got a fully, it's fully customizable. Um, so it's, uh, we're basically now a production company and, uh, we're just about to launch something brand new, which <clears throat> I don't know if I should be spilling too many beans, but I will real quick. So in a couple of weeks, we're launching something called Deggy world. We basically acquired a software company. And if anybody has seen or ever played the Sims, it's basically that. So it's a fully virtual world where anybody can go in and you have a little avatar and we've got three concert stages in there and a full conference center as well. So it can be used for classrooms, trade shows, full festivals. So it's something that's going to be launching in the next two weeks. Um, so we have pretty much dove head first into the virtual world and it's been a very, very steep learning curve, um, but happy to chat about it. I'm, I'm loving it. We're absolutely loving it. Um, and then uh, I'm hoping, hoping that we are going to be announcing our lineup for Home County's virtual event tomorrow. So fingers crossed there. But that is happening July 16 and 17 is when we will be broadcasting that. So happy to be here. Sorry for talking so long. Let's move on to other people. You've been invited to talk, Tim. So thank you for talking. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting what you say, like just how you've jumped head first into into things. It's you know that's kind of where a lot of us have have come, and, it, and there might be an element of sink or swim to it. But I mean, I hopefully this is a panel and this is a discussion that can teach us all to at least float a little bit. Um, if I can move on to Tarun now uh, to tell us how things are going. Are you on the west coast? I am, and uh, summer has not come out this way yet, unfortunately. We're in like this long string of semi-rainy 20 degree days. Um, we, have, we haven't seen heat over like 20 degrees yet this summer. So, you know, you guys are lucky out there. You're doing good. Uh, I wanted to start off by acknowledging as well that I'm on the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. And also by saying um, really loudly, Black Lives Matter. And us in the Canadian music industry, um, we are the beneficiaries. And our, our biggest stars are uh, Black or playing music that is derived and appropriated from Black people. And uh, yet, you know, traditional Black genres um, in Canada get a, a, an extremely small proportion of the funding and the support. So I think that all of us working in the industry across Canada have to be a lot better at including uh, Black and Indigenous voices in these kinds of gatherings. And this is just something that I'm saying at every single meeting and panel I'm at these days, because I don't think we can talk about this stuff enough. Um, so in terms of streaming, I run uh, the largest South Asian youth event in Canada. Um, I'm also obviously part of a, part of a band. Um, and I also run a record label devoted to South Asian, uh, breaking South Asian talent. Um, so I as well, you know, was, I guess I'm an early adopter. And so as soon as stuff started going pear shaped with COVID, we were like, okay, what do we do? So, you know, we learned Twitch um, and started doing Friday nights and Saturday night parties. And we were doing like the biggest South Asian dance party on the internet, I think every Saturday night. So we were getting about 3000 folks out and raising uh, almost 5,000 bucks every Saturday for COVID support. Um, so this was mostly people that were based in Vancouver, but then we started getting guest DJs come in from, you know, all over North America. Uh, and that was fun. Uh, but what I've definitely seen over the last few weeks, especially since out here, you know, we're, we have very low COVID levels. Um, we're seeing like huge declines in the number of people that are interested in virtual stuff. Like the numbers are half of what they were. And I think they'll probably get even less as people are like, learning what it's like to hang out with other people again, which is fantastic. Uh, the other thing that I'm deeply involved with is uh, a Minecraft festival called Rave Family Block Fest, um, which is happening this weekend in Minecraft. And so my record label Snakes and Ladders is, uh, we've built a stage and booked 25 artists, mostly from India, but also from Canada and the States. And that's another sort of version of streaming because the back end of the Minecraft festival. So. For those of you who don't know what Minecraft is, it's the biggest, uh, most popular video game in the world. And you, you know, you sort of move into this world and there's all of these stages sort of scattered around this world. And as you move close to the stage, each of these stages is a number of artists playing over the course of four days. 
And as you move closer to the stage, the mix cloud back end kind of stitches music in. So you can like hang out with your friends in your avatar form and go check out various artists. And it's wild. It's a video game. So you can do whatever you like in there. There's all sorts of like crazy stuff and you can buy merch. Um, you can buy merch in the video game, but you can also buy merch in real life that gets shipped to your house. So, so many possibilities there. Uh, and, and my festival has just launched a, a sort of app based multi-month experience that ties together um, like actual physical movement with creative challenges and stuff to, to see like players like move around a bunch, you know, 40 different stages towards this sort of grand prize at the end. So we launched that on July 16th. So yeah, lots of stuff in this virtual landscape. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> um, y you bring up a, a, a number of, uh, of really uh, great talking points that we could probably further discuss during this this discussion today but I think one of the things is uh, just highlighting the possibilities and I know you know as much as we've kind of uh, we have to treat this you know we're all kind of isolated and it's hard for all of us and we're, we're not able to cut to kind of go and see each other right now but the streaming world has uh, the one benefit of being able to bring a lot of people together from all different parts of the world uh, at the same time. And I think that's something that uh, can be celebrated from, from this kind this, I don't, you know, I don't want to call it the new normal, but from what's evolved from the, uh, the pandemic. So, uh, you know, your Minecraft festival kind of brings that to mind, just bringing all these people together from everywhere. Kathleen, how's that life on your end? You've found Wi-Fi and a little piano and pig bombs. Couldn't find Wi-Fi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I couldn't find Wi-Fi, and I sh showed up at this little boutique hotel in Picton. I'm in Prince Edward County, and I literally tapped on the door, and they gave me this room. It's very casual with the pigs. That's just for all of you. I do not play the piano, if anybody would like to hop on board with that. Um, so I guess all is well with us. We are um, up north. We just were uh, shooting uh, music for Ocan, the Afro-Cuban band. Um, and we wrote a grant for Factor and did an incredible outdoor music video for them. And that's part of the way that we've been pivoting it as well. KRP, my production company, focuses on live event production and broadcast and digital. Um, everything has an audience that we do. So um, whether it was a conference, uh, it was a large gathering, an event, um, something with music, a television broadcast, we definitely had to completely pivot. I always think it's like Ross from Friends. I'm just like trying to get that couch down the stairs and figure it all out and yelling pivot at the same time because it's, it's been really difficult. But at the same time, we've been able to find different ways to engage the audience and that's our our biggest goal and i'm sure it is for artists and for anybody out there listening um we're trying to find ways to en enhance that sensory experience at home um because you don't have that in person so we're looking at other options where there's studios you can bring in artists and you can almost give a little bit more of a an experience to the lighting and sound that you would expect on a concert stage which is sort of the next level that we're looking into for live performances so that people can get a more well-rounded performance other than what you're just seeing right here although today i have a great background but not everybody necessarily has that background so we're looking into options for artists to do that as well and bringing in partnerships as well to sponsor it um, but the main thing that we've done is listen to our artists and understand the feeling and atmosphere that they want to achieve with their performance and then looking at ways we can pepper in um, other elements of their um, personal life and um, showing their personality so we've just been listening to the world and following the steps and um, I want to echo as well what was said before about Black Lives Matter and about um, inclusivity. And uh, we are very, very, very much on that side of history. And we're working on a new presentation called Black North on July 20th at the Great Hall. Um, if anyone's interested in learning about um, demanding more equality in boardrooms. So across the board in Canada, demanding companies to have to raise the level of um, people of color in boardrooms. And that's our... Uh, our goal for the next uh, six to 10 months, I guess. And that's me. 
Thanks, Kathleen. No problem. <laughs> um, just listening to all of our, our, our panelists speak, uh, a question that kind of came to mind because Danielle mentioned uh, Twitch, as did Darun, and then you know Tim mentioned that they've got a, a new platform that they've started. And Kathleen was just talking about a uh, you know enhancing their space and, and engaging audiences that way. So there are so many possibilities in terms of platforms on which to stream. So, you know, we've had Twitch and then, you know, we're on Zoom presently and then there's Facebook Live and Instagram Live. And I wondered if uh, our panelists and, and uh, you know, if everyone wants to take a, a chance, to, like a shot at answering this or if, you know, anyone has specific thoughts. Just for all of us who are novices and newbies, uh, where do we start? What's, what, do, what platforms do we use? Which ones are the most engaging? Which ones work well? Um, just a thought on, on platforms. Uh, I'm just going to hop in there for one second. And I wanted to sort of let everybody know, and I want to make sure you can hear me. Everybody? Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, it, goes, it went out a little bit. Um, we started Urgent. U-R-G-N-T, which was originally started as the empty venues concept, um, which uh, we focused on, you know, not only bringing attention to the artists that might not have the stage, but also the venues that might not have the artists to come in and the people coming in. So we wanted to support both. Obviously, when COVID really took a turn, we lost the opportunity to be in the actual venue. So we still, what we did was, do partnerships with local organizations as well as the venue, used all their platforms, and then via Vimeo was able to blast out through the Facebook for the, the, the bar, the partner, which might be like, you know, a local brewery. Um, we also were able to use any sponsorship from um, like Solo Tech or Sim International for any type of uh, donated gear. And that raised the level of people that were uh, viewing and the amount of people we were reaching. So it wasn't just the art relying on the artist's immediate Facebook. It was um, any sort of organization that wanted to come on board and support that performance or that festival. So uh, when we had performances of about 13, 15 artists in a festival lineup, we were getting upwards of 30,000 views for the evening. Um, especially when we did Misha, um, goodness, I always pronounce her name wrong. Um, Misha Brigger Grossman, um, we had just shy of 30,000 people uh, watching because we used Vimeo as our platform, our live streaming platform, and through there, with just a small membership or subscription, you can actually click on every single Facebook page you are added on as an admin. So that way you could have five different, 10 different, whatever you have as a support, who everybody wants to support you and you can send out to as many people. A lot of people are gonna click it open and click it close, but a lot of people who you wouldn't expect might keep it open. So it's a really good way to expand how many people that you're actually showing your music to or your art to and that's just my two cents. If you wanna look up Urgent, it, it's a really good way to learn um, and I don't mind answering any questions about that either. I'm happy to take a stab at platforms as well. And I'm so glad that there are people here. I just, it, as, as somebody who makes the music, it's really nice to hear about all of the industry support and all the people who are working so hard uh, to still give artists a platform, to still give venues an opportunity to survive this. Um, I teach at the college, so I do teach in the music industry arts and the performing arts program. So part of my live streaming journey was also because we moved fully online. All of the curriculum was online. And then I was told, okay, Danielle, you're going to be running a performing arts class fully online. Go. Uh, so part of it was just testing out all of the platforms and trying to figure out what kind of technical barriers existed, what kind of things would impact your performance overall. And also just to be that person that if I can click go live, you can too. It's not so scary. Um, in terms of if you are just starting, if you've never done this before and you are only used to face-to-face -face performance, the most important part from an artist's perspective is the performance side and the interaction. And that adds a brand new layer in doing this digitally because it's really important that you're taking into account 
all those things that are coming in for chat when you talk about keeping those viewers for a, for a longer period of time it's because they feel seen when you acknowledge them in the live format which is so different from us standing on stage i get on stage i play my song i tell my story i play my song i get off stage and that's not really from my experience what people are wanting so i would say if you're doing this for the very first time step one is instagram so <laughs> Joel and I actually, if, if anybody is doing this for the first time, if you're terrified, we created this, this platform um, at the beginning of all of this. So I think it was in those first couple days I was trying to figure out, well, I clicked go live. I had a great experience. I felt like I was actually able to talk to other human beings while stuck in my wood paneled basement. Like what a nightmare this place is, is it not? Like so much wood paneling. But I said, well, how can we get other people to also do this and feel confident enough to hit that button? And it's just creating this nice environment where you come, you play two songs, and we're going to send you all of the hearts in the chat, and we're going to engage with you, like you having an engaged audience for the first time. So we've been doing that through open mic, especially as a way of supporting a local venue as well. So sponsors were involved in that, and it's much smaller scale than what Kathleen's doing. <laughs> But it was really just this opportunity to say, just come join us, hit that button for the first time, everything's going to be okay. And the technical barrier there is so low. I'm just, I'm just going to open up that Instagram story and I'm going to join and then it just takes care of itself. Whereas with other platforms, I found if you want to do Facebook Live, right, if you want to do Instagram or if you want to do YouTube Live, going on to Vimeo, those you should be using broadcasting software if you want to cut through the noise. Because again, I think it was just like Tarun was saying that there was incredible numbers those first couple of weeks when you live streamed. And then the Facebook algorithms and things started picking up the fact, well, there's a lot of people live streaming. Let's not show that to as many people anymore. So then you had to come through with really high quality video and high quality audio so that people would be like, okay, well, maybe I'll give this a chance. So that's why Instagram great place to start all you need is a cell phone and you can really get used to that interaction side and focus more on your performance before getting into the other platforms where i'm strongly encouraging now to start using some of that broadcasting software and it's free it's open source i'm happy to answer questions about that even outside of this if people have them then moving on to places like twitch and Tarun, that's just incredible like a minecraft fest like i, I i'm gonna be there uh, but you get into those places where there's there's this different expectation from that audience and you get access to like this global market that I didn't even know was possible from my wood panel basement. Uh, but it is there's there's layers of tech and it takes time and you have to give yourself permission to fail live on the air. I do it almost every time I go live. Uh, but for those of you who are just joining and wanting to go live for the first time, I really recommend Instagram. Thanks, Danielle. Anyone else have anything, Tim? Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say the, I mean, for, for us with our, with the platform that we're using, it's, we're basically just trying to get out of the high compression rates of Zoom for audio and video, because they're, when you push from Zoom to Facebook, your audio gets squashed and sounds like absolute hot garbage. Uh, so, so our platform that we do in with fan effects, it's, we're basically just using it as a production truck, like a television broadcast. So we are sending out, you know, we're capturing high def stuff. So from a platform standpoint, we're basically, we, we use nothing different than anybody else. Um, for us, we, we push our captured, um, the captured audio and video and it pushes to Facebook or we we set up private links on schools, websites like we did. Um, I think it was Florida State University. We did a show with Jason Derulo in the spring and that pushed to a back end of their website where they had a, an SSO. So their students had to log in with their student number to get access to it so that there was uh, some sort of block so that the general public couldn't get in and watch the show. Um, but like Danielle was saying, it's, there's so many options out there. There's like a ton of options to go live. And you know the question of where you should be I think it's where your audience is. Find out where your audience is and go go to them. Um, that I'm so excited for that Minecraft thing, Tarun. I think that's so awesome. And if anybody else, like Fortnite is also, like they were doing these massive concerts with 40 plus million people watching at once. So they did Marshmallow last year and then they've done Travis Scott. And I actually just got a notification that they're starting to do movie nights. 
in in Fortnite. So you log into a video game and then you go and watch a movie, but you're in there with all of your friends playing a video game while watching movies. So the industry is getting real wacky and crazy and it's awesome because like you said, you can now go in and hang out with your friends on the other side of the planet and, and watch a concert. So I think that Minecraft thing, that's really, really awesome that you're getting into that. It's going to be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it's, it's been, um, it's been a really interesting, you know, there's so many, I think that's the thing with this new world is that there's so many challenges that we just hadn't thought of before. Uh, Microsoft updated something on the, their servers and, you know, it caused the festival to be delayed by two weeks because they had to like go in and change the routing for a bunch of, you know, different information flows. Uh, what I was going to say is, I know this is a folk music um, sort of centered thing, so it might not be relevant to everyone, but uh, definitely at the moment, Twitch is the platform that's the easiest to deal with copyright wise. They don't care as much. Um, so if you're DJing stuff or, or you, you know, you're doing like a radio show, uh, on Facebook, you're going to find your your audio just like constantly sort of stripped back and the same on YouTube. But on Twitch, they'll let you do the thing live and then they'll strip the copyrighted audio afterwards. So your sort of backup sessions won't look great, but at least you can get by live. Um, I know this is changing every day and there's constantly people trying to sort of figure out the licensing side of thing. That's a whole other issue, but uh, that's my two cents. Thanks, Tom. Um yeah, there, that's a, it's a whole other discussion that, that licensing and royalties and all of that stuff. And I know, uh, you know, SoCan had started um, allowing artists to submit their uh, online performances for uh, royalty collections. So that's a, that's a nice move on their part. Um, hopefully people can look into that and we can, uh, or FMO probably has uh a way to make sure that the message goes out to our members that that's happened. It's probably already gone through the newsletter. So, um, but keep that in mind. Um, it's, it's funny because, you know, talking, just asking a question about platforms, uh, you know, we've heard five, six different platforms and like levels upon levels of that even within what we're doing right now. So it's really, you know, tr for us to try to navigate this, uh, this space, it's, it's, you know, it can be a bit daunting for, uh, for the, for the newbies, for the novices in the, in the room. Um, just, I, I've had a little look through the, the videos or the, the names on the screens that I've seen and I'm recognizing a lot of, uh, artists um, as well as some festival and, and presenter members so I wondered if um, if if Tim and Tharun maybe could could give us a little bit just for our festival members who might be uh, watching just about moving festivals online and 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 what that experience has been like for you because I think that might be beneficial to them you go ahead first sir I will follow your lead. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what I, it's funny because again, I think the landscape is just changing so quickly. Like we, um, my salad just arrived. Yay. Um, I think in the beginning, the solution was like find, you know, some people are mentioning, I see here in the chat, a lot of folks are talking about OBS and Twitch and, you know, I'm sure people are using Restream and stuff as well. Uh, to like, you know, do just a, a typical like global citizen style concert where you're like, you know, you've got a bunch of pre-recorded things and you're like streaming them, or you're trying to do the whole thing where you, I guess this is one piece of advice, even though it's nice to get a bunch of people playing live consecutively, I've never seen it pulled off. It never works. Something always goes wrong with the tech. So get, you know, maybe have a host who's live and then do pre-recorded stuff for the rest because otherwise there's just not a lot of satisfaction that's going to happen on the part of the, uh, of the audience. But I've also seen that at the moment, um, it is hard to get the same numbers as we were seeing a few a few months ago. So I'm thinking that the, the future may well be uh, some kind of a combination of like, you know, there being a sort of VIP live experience where, you know, 100 people in Vancouver, we can go to a club now, 100 people and they have to be separated. But maybe 100 people win a ticket to be there. And then, you know, the rest, the, the rest of the folks are sort of watching and streaming, but there's some kind of interaction. I think that the way that musicians are in front of people um, the way that I am in front of people is different than the way I am when there's no one and just cameras. 
Uh, and I think we see the same thing when we're watching like Stephen Colbert. It's so much less interesting now that there's no like response from the audience. And so I think that the next level now that things are loosening up is going to be some kind of a combination of, you know, live streaming and having audience members there to some degree. Uh, because I think that just straight up live stream thing, again, I think um, maybe it will, you know, maybe in a second peak in the fall when it gets cold again, people will come back to that. But at the moment, we're not seeing those numbers anymore. <clears throat> I agree completely, especially with the everybody playing live at the same time. Um, so for home County, we're our virtual festival that we're going and, and converting to, I will be doing most of the hosting live. And then all of the artists that we've hired, they're all submitting pre-recorded videos to us. Um, and that was for a number of reasons, mainly just to deal with any tech issues. Um, just because with all of the live streaming stuff that Deggy has been doing on Friday nights, we've had performers cut out. Uh, like Tarun was talking about with DJs, we, we tried to do a DJ and Facebook shut the stream down only in Canada, not in the States. Um, so to deal with all that stuff, I was just like, I don't want to deal with any tech things. Also, it just allows the artists to provide me and provide us with a set that they would like put out in the public and not have to be concerned about anything they can control their audio quality their video um, all of that um, so that's that's what we're doing we're just doing all pre-recorded um, all pre-recorded sets coming to us we've got a partner in town who's been doing corporate like corporate streaming events for conferences for about 15 years they're coming on board um, to help us with pushing the stream out so we're kind of building that whole thing and it's interesting because I've gone from an artistic director to basically a television producer I'm now I'm now building out full on TV scripts with like call in times, um, blocking schedules. Like, are there going to be ads? I've got to go and get ads. I've got to make time for ads. Like it's, it's a complete kind of shift in what <laughs> I'm used to doing, which is fun. I love learning new things. It's great. Um, but with respect to numbers too, like I've been telling members of the home County board, like, as much as I would love to see 5,000 people watching this event, if I get 150 people watching concurrently, I'm going to be happy. Um, for me, the numbers are going to come two weeks within the first two weeks after. Like we've, with Deggy, we were running, we were running free shows with all American rejects and getting 80 people watching. And then three days later we had 40,000 views because all American rejects then tweeted out that, Hey, check out this concert that we did. And then all of a sudden our video views went through the roof. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm angling. And that's, I know where this is, where the, the bulk of the views are going to be coming after the fact. Um, and I think just to kind of quickly speak about the whole experience thing, I totally agree. Having some sort of VIP experience is, is the way to go. Um, I can, if I'm allowed to share my screen, no, I'm not. Okay. I can, uh, I can send something up, but what we do is we're doing like VIP backstage meet and greets when we do shows for the colleges where we set up, it's like a, a photo, a photo op where we've got the screen set up with all of the different artists set up. And then we just cycle through everybody who's in the VIP and take screen grabs. And then we email it out to them. So they've got a meet and greet. So I've got a photo with Scott Hellman, Tim Hicks, walk off the earth and Mariana's trench because we did a big virtual show for colleges with all of them. And we had like 30 people in, and then just like cycled through all of them and they like just smiled and all the artists, they had a great time. So it's, it's finding out different things to do with your fans to kind of get them engaged um, and to have, have fun with it. But it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's, it's a really, really weird, weird shift in, in how we're doing it. One quick other thing, Pritam, um, uh, is that I think the nice thing about getting the pre-recorded stuff is artists tend to spend a little bit more time um, like getting their space set up. And once you've got all those submissions, as long as you've properly contracted it, you also have stuff that you can then use for like months afterwards, like little, you know, moments from various performances, which is really helpful when you're, you know, like keeping your social media happy with your festival. So it's, it's a nice way of having a bunch of different content that you can repackage for other reasons. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm just going to get Kathleen to jump in for a second. Um, what I was going to say was just uh, going off of Tim and Taryn's 
chat about what we're doing, you know, setting up at home. What we also did, have been doing is if you're pre-recording, you can also record um, a walk in the park or a tree and do some B-roll of your own. It's like so easy. You literally, you can use portrait mode on your phone. You can, um, you can walk down the street and if you're doing something dramatic, get a bunch of people in their masks standing, look at you for a dramatic part in the song. You can learn to edit so easily from home. Like it's dummy proof. There are free apps. Um, Canva can make little videos, can make little logos for your videos. Um, you really have every single thing for free on the internet. You can do it. Uh, there's a little a app called Literally Video Editor. And it has an orange um, logo. And you can download that and you can add your music in. You can mix things together. I downloaded Premiere. I'd never edited before because I usually hire editors. But I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try. And it took me an, about an hour. I was YouTubing. Some people on explaining things on YouTube are super annoying. But you find the right ones and they'll give you a couple of little um, tips and tricks of how to do it. And it's so simple. And the reason why I say about adding in beyond what Taryn was saying. And I know you're nodding along, Taryn, about you know adding in the B-roll too. But you really get to learn someone's personality by what's in their space. So getting close up to their books and panning down all the books you read. Or if it's like the sunset at the end of the day, or if it's the guacamole you're making, it doesn't really matter. But I think it's really important because you have to learn to jump out of the screen because we are all now becoming television producers. And um, what we're also learning is it's not not that hard to be a television producer um, even though we all complain as television producers so uh, what I encourage everybody to do is look at all those different tools that you have and challenge yourself and anything that you think you couldn't edit or you couldn't put b-roll it is so much easier you can download Premiere Pro for 30 days and test it and not get charged so if you have any other questions about that I'm happy to talk about it but the, the sky's the limit with what you can do Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. It gives us an opportunity. I mean, uh, for a lot of us who are performers, you know, our we're used to this is this is we're here. Our audience is there. There's that just that little two way thing. And now we've got this opportunity to bring so much more of our own lives and personality, you know, outside of just through our music. Uh, bring people kind of into our worlds. It's sort of like when we're on this Zoom meeting, like we can see the backgrounds, we can see everybody's homes and how you live in a way. And it's kind of, it, it gives you a little bit more. <laughs> yes, you can see Kathleen's pig painting. Um, gives us a little bit more, uh, you know, opportunity to, to get our personality out there. Um, so I guess, uh, Joel, would it be wise to maybe move on? Because it looks like we have lots of questions from the audience. Would given us the last 15 minutes or so for audience questions? Is that a, a good way to, to, to go? I think it would be. Uh, I think it would be. There is quite a few questions. Uh, first, mm -hmm. thank you to all the panelists and to you, Breedham. You did a great job moderating, my friend. That's a great work. Um, why don't I go with one of these questions that I saw right near the bottom? Uh, I think people might benefit from knowing a basic bare bones suggested hardware setup, i.e. maybe a condenser mic, USB audio interface, cam, front lit. Um, that is actually a good question. Like, do you want to be using an SM or do you want to be using a condenser? Um, yeah, so that's a question. I'm happy to help if anybody, and there was a couple questions regarding um, whether or not you could run OBS on your own at the same time. What I've learned in the last few months is that live streaming, yes, people have been doing it for a couple of years, but it's still so ridiculously new and there are still so many problems that every new piece of gear showcases. What I loved about Twitch when I set up is I saw the next level of live stream setup, and I was like, how do I do that? And it took hundreds of gear reviews, hundreds of tutorials. I've, I've learned that if you just cry at music gear long enough, sometimes it works. So if that strategy helps you, it's helped me a lot. Um, but nobody has the same setup. So I've never met anybody who has the exact same pieces of gear, exact same software. You got your Mac, your PC people, all of the infighting, of course. Um, but there's a lot of really great people on Twitch who understand how hard it is. 
And I mean, there's open software because there's so many people who are wanting to do this and build a community around doing this. So they're sharing that free software. They're sharing all of these bots that we use on all of our channels. And so a lot of people have their gear lists. So I really recommend that you just watch as many streams as you can, get to know a lot of your favorite streamers. And a lot of people are really open. So I do host Wednesday now office hours where it's really drop in. You can ask me anything. And we've got just a community of people who kind of join and, and we troubleshoot a bunch of problems together. We even set up little goals for all of our own projects and how we're going to support each other through those goals. So uh, when it comes to hardware and software, that's a really long conversation that I don't think we could even get to if we spent the entire hour talking about it, because uh, it is, it's trial and error. But if people have any questions about that, I use Streamlabs OBS because it works specifically with Twitch and all of the widgets that people expect to see on Twitch are integrated really well with it. But it does take a lot of processing power on your computer. So we're also in a pandemic. Like, Getting access to gear isn't super easy. You might be waiting weeks for certain things. And so a lot of people are really understanding with that too. Uh, don't be hard on yourself and think like, I need the greatest computer. I need to drop $7,000 in gear right now. Uh, people actually get really excited to tune into another stream when you've gone from like my garbage cell phone that I'm still using as a camera. Like I will get so many viewers joining just because they're like, what HD, that's wild. I'm like, yeah, it's just going to take two months to make my capture card work. But other than that, stick around and maybe you'll see it one day. So work on it slowly. And every time you add a new widget, you add one new thing, uh, people literally get so hyped about it. So don't obsess over gear and things if you're starting out. Uh, do the easy thing. Instagram, move up. If you can actually do two at the same time without spending money on Restream, if you're an artist that can't afford something like that. Uh, then try to set up, I had, I had a two cameras set up for a long time, streaming on I, IG and, and FB at the same time. And then you move in once you're comfortable. Open up OBS. It's terrifying to look at. But if you've decided my audience is on Facebook and YouTube, well, I can spend about a month and I can give myself that time to say, I don't know anything about this. I just want to play guitar. But if you want to adapt and have the opportunity to perform, it really is worth it. And it's worth that time investment. So OBS is my recommendation if you want to stream anywhere uh, other than Twitch. And if you just want to be on Twitch, then Streamlabs OBS. But again, I'm happy to answer any of those questions. It's just a really long talk. <laughs> gear, gear can get that way, whether you're talking music or you know, video or whatever. Uh, but you were speaking about Twitch and here's a question from Jillian Alexander and maybe Tarun, you can uh, come in on this as well. You mentioned Twitch. I've seen some friends really build their audiences on Twitch and I'm wondering if it is difficult to build an audience there. Do you kind of just go and tag things appropriately? Um, like, do you just use your own socials to bring people in? How do you get those, we were talking about this, Danielle, longer watchers, not shorter watchers, long watchers, um, those twi that Twitch audience, how do you get them in there? Is it a tagging? Is there other tricks? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at this first. Uh, there's there's a bunch of tricks. I think the, the, the basic piece of advice is like tell people you're going to be on Twitch at a certain time <laughs> and make it really easy for them to join. Uh, one thing that was really popular for us on our Saturday night parties uh, was to have a concurrent Zoom call. Um, and we had dance parties on the Zoom call. So we would like be streaming on Twitch. We'd tell everyone for the whole week, like, oh my God, you can't miss the party on Saturday night, blah, 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 and all of our socials and email lists and everything. And then when people came into the Twitch, we would, we would post every once in a while, we'd post in the chat on the, the right-hand side of the screen, a link to a Zoom call that you could only get if you came to Twitch. Um, and the nice thing on Twitch as well is to force people to follow you by, by necessitating that they follow you to comment. Um, so once they come into your channel, then they can get the link to the Zoom call and sort of like a private dance party. And then on the, on the dance party on the Zoom call, which was happening again concurrently with no music, it's just people dancing. Um, we tell, you know, we would have instructions on the Twitch about like how to set it up properly. Uh, then we would award people like the best dancers, like we'd sort of highlight the screen and we'd broadcast the Zoom call into the back. <laughs> it's getting complicated, but broadcast the Zoom call into the back of the DJ. So you could see, you know, the DJ's playing in front and then there's all these little squares of people dancing in back of them. And then we'd highlight different rooms, which are different households in Surrey mostly. And the winners of the dance contest, we would send them food 
from one of our sponsors live. So you could actually see the food get delivered to the Zoom call and people are like eating the food and there's this feeling of interactivity that you just straight up can't get at like a club, let's say. Um, so I think coming back to the question of how do you get people to come, I think advertising, but the other thing in Twitch that's interesting is if you're friends with other channels, if they're doing a broadcast, you can get them to raid your channel. And so when they finish your channel, all of those viewers come to your channel. So if there's like a hundred people watching your friend's channel and you aim it, you, you, you know, you schedule it right, you can get all of those people to yours and then you can throw to another channel afterwards. So work with friends is the other piece of advice and book, book headliners, book talent, because that can work too. I think can, that, those are all great points. And I think consistency as well. It's kind of like building a podcast. You just, I mean, I've, I've done some Twitch streaming like by playing video games, <laughs> doing the whole video gaming on, on Twitch. And uh, same with like, I had a podcast for a long time and con consistency is key. Making sure that you are um, broadcasting and putting stuff out consistently at the same time so people know when they can come and watch you. I think that's a really, really key point to all of that as well. Great points, everybody. Uh, I would also say uh, check the chat while we're uh, doing this Q&A because there's a lot of uh, interesting thoughts from the panelists on tech and what have you. Um, a question about video games. You guys mentioned a Sims-like type of thing for concerts, also a concert in Minecraft concert in Fortnite, I think it was mentioned as well. Um, this is a completely new scene as far as a space for watching performance is concerned, using avatars in a 3D zone. Um, do you anticipate that streamers or, or, you know, whomever, bigger bands, whoever they might be, might continue to use these types of things moving forward or maybe move into the VR space, for example? Interested your thoughts on those ones. Um, I've had conversations with a VR company, a couple of VR companies about what they're doing. Um, I know there is a, a VR company based out of, I believe it's Germany, it could be Sweden, um, who their, their plan is to basically do what Fortnite and Minecraft are doing. They're, they're wanting to build full VR uh, venues um, that would be accessible to anybody with an Oculus. Um, and, and then when you would, you would go in, I've seen some demos. They, they sent me some demos because we were in chats with them and it's pretty insane. It's, you know, basically like a green screen, but it's a full 360. You can turn around, you can walk around in the venue. It's a full, they've got a full light team doing the lasers live during the DJ set. So it's not, the Fortnite was a fully pre-programmed set because they had to do all the coding in the background of the video game to just it here. It's a 30 minute pre-programmed basically show. Um, but these guys are trying to do a live VR experience with lighting directors doing all of the VR programming live, which is pretty nuts. Um, I think that I, for me, I love it. <laughs> I really love VR. I think there's a lot of great potential there. I think the um, barrier to entry is the six to $700 cost for the Oculus Rift. Uh, and you also just can't get the Oculus system right now. They pretty much sell out as soon as they get released. So it's, I think that's the the tough part for VR, but um, I, I, I think that any artist would be silly to turn down the opportunity to play a concert in Minecraft or Fortnite because that Travis, I think it was Travis Scott had 40 million people watch that show. It's an insane, it was the big, the largest concert ever. Um, it's just an insane number and that's right in the target demographic for, for that style of music, for, for hip hop and pop music. It's in that 11 to 18 year old demographic that they're all wanting to hit. So I can see it. I can see it more and more of those happening. All right. We've got a question from Gary and I'm going to unmute you here, Gary, so you can ask it yourself. Oh my gosh. I'm unmuted. You are unmuted. Thank you, Joel. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Gary Raspberry. I'm here in Kingston. Uh, the beautiful breeze blowing off the lake. Not really, but it sounds good. I just wanted to wish everybody well and uh, send positive things to all of you for doing all that you're doing, because we're not going to get to see each other backstage and we're all we gather. So I want to send out some love to everybody. And I don't want to brag, but <clears throat> I've got the book of answers here. 
So, you know, if, if there's maybe a future seminar, I'll go through, you know, I've got pretty much all the answers right here. So um, I did want to ask, I've been hosting uh, an event here in Kingston uh, at, at a ca local cafe. It's been a coffee house. It's been supported by the Skeleton Park Arts Festival. And we've gathered, uh, a, you know, a big number of people, a lot of performances. And my question is, there's... Uh, more and more need to for musicians to play together synchronous, synchronously, and that technology uh, seems to be sadly lacking unless you're really famous. So, anybody, any ideas on what's coming or what's possible? Thanks. I can speak to it, and I know that it's it's coming, but it's it's a work in progress. The delays. I mean, we're seeing it with Ryan Seacrest. We're seeing it with um, The View in the Morning, Whoopi Goldberg still talking over Joy, Joy Behar. I mean, it doesn't, it's, we're not there yet, but we're getting close. And I know I had a call with Cisco actually this morning, Cisco, the head of Cisco Canada, talking about their WebEx programs and seeing how we can get around these delays, especially when it comes to, I mean, interviews as well, but music specifically so that we can sync properly. So it seems like it's coming. It seems like it's extremely difficult to um, offer to the masses. Um, but I mean, you know, this, this world moves fast and furious. So I'm sure that we can see it in the next you know, six to 10 months is my guess. Okay, we got time for just one more question. Uh, and it's from Chanel. How can you set yourself apart from other live streams? Tim was saying that they're providing meeting greets. I think that's a great idea too. Is there something else that uh, you guys might recommend uh, along the lines uh, of that for new artists who are still building that fan base? I kind of already touched on that earlier, just in terms of the B-roll, and I'm not, I, I won't repeat that necessarily, but I think expanding on that idea even more. So picture yourself when you're performing at a venue. You walk in and you norm normally say like, hey, everybody, you're like, give me a sec. Those little bits you can, you can include. It doesn't have to be a, a straight start from the minute that you click on with your Instagram or Facebook Live. Give them a sense of the atmosphere while you're playing. You know, whether it's like street sounds that are coming out or, you know, the kettle boiling or little things as you as you're fixing the tech and you're warming up. I mean, for me, I find that when I'm watching a um, when I'm watching a live stream, I like to see their setting up. I like to hear the, the bass player going, dum, 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 you know, figuring out what they're going to do next. And that sort of makes you realize like this is real, they are real, this is the exact same, we're just not actually in the same room. So, you know, as using as much characteristics from yourself and making it a bit raw, I would say. A bit raw helps a lot. And I would say it's just about you building a community. So just as you are using this as an opportunity to engage with the people on platforms that you've already connected with, treat them like they're humans and that interaction really is so important so it's not only the fact that i keep making fun of the wood paneling in my basement it's <laughs> that i have like a couple hundred people now who roast me because of the wood paneling in my basement so you want to acknowledge those comments and bring people in that way uh, and there's other places where you can create not only like you know some people have their facebook groups I'm not a huge fan of Facebook, so I've got a community that's on Discord, so it's kind of this safe little haven away from everything else that the super hardcore fans, those are the ones who are able to um, engage with you on the next level. You're really using them to build something with you. So if you treat it like, I can be honest about the fact that I don't know what I'm doing and I'm learning, then people are more than happy to jump on board and help build this thing. So when they see things happen to you live on the air, uh, things like if you're on Twitch, then you know that there's raids where you can just bring your entire community when you finish your stream, you bring them to a new stream. And that's why I loved that platform when I first moved on to there, because not only can I build something, but I can bring this thing that I built to other places and help support fellow artists. And that's what I just genuinely love so much about the platform. Uh, and those people, I never knew that this was a thing that existed, that you didn't want to just see this super polished show. I've practiced these songs hundreds of times. People are like, live learn. 
I'm like, I don't even know what that is. They're like, we want you to learn a song in front of us. I'm like, that is the most annoying thing I could possibly do in front of you. Are you sure? And this is a platform where people pay money for that. Like, they're just like, here's money. I want you to learn this song right now. It's going to be super annoying. But they want to see the behind the scenes. Uh, and I watched a couple of different um, interviews with some of the biggest, the biggest streamers and the biggest music streamers. And it really is. Some days their stream is, this is a fly on the wall stream. I'm setting up my, my cell phone in the corner behind the scenes. You get to see us setting up the whole stage. I'm never going to interact with you. But there's thousands of people because they just want to see what's happening behind the scenes. So the interaction is really key, uh, the building a community, and the being honest about where you're at and asking for help. And I don't think that we're always very good at, at doing that as artists, uh, but this is a time when we all really do need that help. So it doesn't need to be financial help uh, for other people who are struggling. They feel like they get to help just by answering a tech question or, or doing a tweet to, to get people to your Twitch channel. So there's lots of fun ways you can engage. And with that, my friends, we have come to the end of our panel discussion. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Danielle, Tim, Kathleen, and Tarun for joining us for your panel thoughts. And thank you so much, Preetam for being an awesome moderator to everybody who is listening in we have been recording this uh session so if you didn't get all the notes don't worry i'm going to be sending a recording to each and every one of you by email within the next couple of days uh, and then please feel free to share that video with literally everyone you know that would be lovely shameless self-promotion there please do share it <laughs> thanks again panelists thank you bye to bye, everyone. everybody thanks everyone for coming Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Au revoir. Bye, guys. <laughs>